Oh. But here we are at Longleaf Breeze, which is the farm where my parents live. They're subsistence farmers. This is my mom, Amanda Borden. She is an organic gardener, and she's a master gardener. And I'm Adrienne Borden, the director of 50 Plus Ministries. This is Bloom Where You Are, and she's going to teach us about what, what vegetables to grow today in this season. And my dad, Lee Borden, a master gardener also, is manning the camera, which we appreciate him yes, doing. Hello. <laughs> so, Mom, you want to take it away? Yes. Well, we thought we'd give you a little bit of an overview of the way we plant here and then get right to it, planting some special vegetables. So, we want to walk down here and see these raised beds. Not everyone either would want to use raised beds or would have enough space. We happen to have plenty of space. <clears throat> and we also have sloping terrain, which is one reason we decided to plant in raised beds instead of in the ground. But even if you are uh, planting in a smaller area, in containers, let's say, the principles we talk about today will apply for you too. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the choices we've made here. Let's start out by, and anytime you want to ask a question or you, or you get a question from someone, okay. I'm happy to answer it. Yes, so we're watching your comments, everybody. If you have a question, we'll look at it. And if you have if you have technical problems, let us know about that too. Right. And you may be wondering, what am I carrying here? Obviously, an experienced gardener would know. Plant, I want to show you, is a pepper plant. Um, this is, these are actually banana peppers, and I'm not planting all of those today. For the sake of keeping us on schedule, I'm just going to plant one or two of each, well, two tomato plants, and one of these, one of each kind of uh, vegetable that we might be interested in, and then move on to another one, other kinds of questions. So I have my little handy-dandy carrying case here to keep me organized, and I have a shovel. And these are uh, banana plants that, um, actually, we bought these at a garden shop, and I gave two of them away. Actually, I think I gave them to you. <laughs> so, Thank um, you. That's why I only have four in my little pack here. Um, typically, when you buy transplants like this, in most cases, we want to talk about one notable exception, you plant that at container depth. That is, however deep this plant is in the container, that's the soil level you want to have when you finish installing it in the ground. And um, I don't think I'll have to dig this too deep at all. I had a cover crop on all these beds in the winter time, and I, I just pulled that the other day. And that's one reason my soil, it doesn't need any kind of tilling. It doesn't really have any uh, major issues with compaction. So I can just plant right in here without too much difficulty. filling around it. I actually, since I mentioned I gave you two of the plants out of that, I gave you the plant tag that came with it as well. Yes. <laughs> so it's always I'm, good to have a plant tag. <laughs> this is an important basic um, concept for planting banana pepper. I put a, a label on that. So I made my own. You can buy these little homemade tags or even make them out of old blinds or something. You can do all kinds of cheap ways to do it. But I like these plastic ones and you can actually just write on them with a pencil for your label and it'll stay on there. It, it's better, a Sharpie fades or a pen over time, but pencil, that's a, a handy tip I hope for people. So uh, that's why, oh, do me a favor, hand me the watering can. Right. I went ahead and pre-filled that nice. because you want to be sure you water in your transplant after you get it in the ground. And you may wonder, what are these hoses, these black hoses we have on top of our beds? We have drip irrigation in place. Uh, given the, the size of all these beds, we would just wear ourselves out. I think if we had to water in person, or standing here, uh, we do water in person. But <laughs> I can actually be up there in my lodging and, and have it watered. So um, drip irrigation has worked well for us. It actually does a good job of getting water directly to the roots of the plant instead of the leaves. You really don't want to wet the leaves. Um, so, uh, and if you have any questions about how we did the drip or anything about that, please feel free to ask. So, I'm going to give all of this a good drip watering later, but this will at least get it started. Okay. So that's our pepper. Now, tomatoes. You probably wondered why I didn't start with tomatoes, because that's probably the most popular 
vegetable. I know that's one of my that favorite ones. Wants to, well, and, and it's, it seems to be the most popular one to grow. But technically, isn't tomato a fruit? It's actually both a fruit and a vegetable. Really, yes. Dr. Um, Borden, tell us well, more. Well, I would say refer you to the articles by Dr. Joe Campbell, K-E-M-B-L-E, of Auburn University. He's a horticulturist who's uh, written about this, and and I, he did a webinar on it a couple of weeks ago for the Alabama Smart Yards. And he can explain it brilliantly, much better than I can. But it has characteristics that it overlaps. Um, but technically, it, when people say, eh, it's a fruit, we treat it like we eat it like a vegetable. And it is a fruit, but it has characteristics of both. So. Okay, interesting. Yes. Okay. Well, well, should right. I bring the watering can? Please do. Yes, we're going to. And I think I'll just leave my kneeling pad there and stick with the cart. Okay. For now. Um, and, and while we're talking about Auburn University, many of the resources that we uh, master gardeners, most of them actually, come from um, our ACES, as well as most master gardeners in Alabama. Uh, I want to make sure they can hear you. Okay. Master gardeners in Alabama are affiliated with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. And there's actually a lot of information that is on their website. And so if you just put in aces.edu, right? Um, then they're going to find that that information mm -hmm. Alabama Cooperative Extension System You can just Google that and it'll lead you there But um, you can search their site for information about planting tomatoes or any other kind of vegetable and a brilliant series um, On that site about Alabama vegetable gardening and I would refer you to that. Okay. Now the first tomato I actually have three <laughs> This one I've already planted And uh, Adrian is later going to post I guess on the web on your yes. site um, a picture of what this plant looked like before I planted it. Um, it was huge, and I um, did what I'm going to do to this one, which is I defoliated uh, a good bit of the plant, and let me take that off. It's handy to have this because of some, something I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes. But um, what I'm going to do with this one, and what I severely did with this one, this is a better boy, is that... A better boy is the varietal? Vari it's, yeah, it's, it's a, a variety of... Um, well, it's actually a cultivar, I think, of tomato. But look at all those little, if you can get close enough to see the little hairy stem there. All those little hairs are part of a root system. That is, in a tomato plant, is to plant it deep so that that stem is under the soil in contact with soil, water, and with the, the leaves in contact with sunlight. And voila, you will have a large plant. You yes. may wonder why is this at sort of an angle? It is because... I, you can, if you want to dig a really big plant that was that tall all the way down, you can, but it's a lot of work. So there's a trick to it. You can actually plant sort of a dig sort of a trench and put the root ball down in the deepest part of that trench. Oh. And then, so that's why it looks like it's coming out kind of sideways. I just did this this morning. But after a few days, this plant will be drawn toward the light and it will straighten up. And you, you defoliated, what is, what is I exfoliated, I guess defoliated. I, I, I took off a good many of the leaves that were on there. And that's what you bear. The, and that's what I, oh, and okay. I buried the bare stem. Now I'm going to demonstrate on this one so you can see it in action. Yay. But that one was sort of an extreme case. Yes, it was such a big plant. <laughs> yeah. Now this one has a story too. This is a 100 and um, I put it out in the elements. I guess that's another digression here is about our weather. We've had some strange weather this spring. Not all of it good. And <laughs> in one of the storms, um, it blew over and this big beautiful plant that already was blooming, um, which you, I didn't really want to let it bloom yet, but it was those root stem, those, those hairs along there. I buried it in here and it's, I mean, it was just down to nothing. So oh, now look wow. at it. I know. Now in my toolkit, I always carry scissors because you can either pinch it off or if you're not I don't have really good sharp fingernails I'm going to clip off this foliage okay and well because it if I had gotten this at the beginning I would have been able to clip up even you know it, more of what was on there but that I lose. so I'm going to leave it at that and I'm going to try to make sure that the soil covers those places where I clipped off um, a uh, a bit of the leaf. Okay. Now let me move a little closer this way and predetermine where my hole needs to be. Uh, for tomato plants, one thing I did not talk about with the pepper is the spacing. Um, the spacing between plants is important. And for a tomato plant, three feet. 
if they're well, if they're going to be large and they're indeterminate, which means they'll keep growing, they're a big vine that's just going to keep and growing. And if they're the in raised season. beds, but if they're in pots, we'll talk about that. A well, in later. a pot, yes, because um, and also if you are planting uh, determinate tomatoes or something that, that doesn't get as large, but in pots, yes, we did put yours a little closer because we're going to keep them pruned back. Yes. The the problem with tomatoes being clo too close together is they need lots of air circulation between the leaves and especially if they get wet. What tomato plants do not like is to have stagnant, humid air that can't, you know, there's no circulation and that the, that the leaves stay wet. That will cause, there are all kinds of the tomato diseases, fungi, uh, you name it, foliar diseases that uh, would be a problem with that. So you want to do everything you can to set a good tone for those tomato plants as you're setting them out. And I've been to all kinds of tomato workshops and um, a conference in which there was a specialty presentation about tomatoes. And bottom line is I have decided, based on all that information, that three feet apart is about right. For the way. <laughs> so I have my ruler. So one, two, three. And to save time, I went in. Oh good, I'm glad. This is where I want my plant to, um, the stem to come up. That's, what's, that's what I want to be three feet apart, are those two stems. So what that means is I probably want to dig a trench over to this side and put that big root ball in there and have that stem come up and it probably would be a little slanted just like that one is to, to begin with. And it's a little bit hit or miss when I do this. I just don't know exactly where where the root ball is going to go, so I, tr I do trial and error, which is falling apart a little bit, but that's not a problem because I can see that it has some nice roots developing here, mm -hmm. so I'm not worried about that. So, okay, that looks good. Now, the nice thing about the trench effect is you don't have to um, worry about, as long as that's covered with soil, it doesn't have to be covered real deeply because here's my stem that's going to be all nice and covered up. See? And then that, that tomato plant's going to be much happier than it would be if it had a lot of stems sticking out from the top okay. into the sun. So, okay. Now, it already had a plant tag. Um, and, you know, one thing I didn't explain why plant tags are important is because a lot of tomato plants, a lot of really pepper plants, you start getting a really good crop from one and not so good from another. You might want to know wonder why these plants are here and why that little pot's there. Um, a big old caterpillar called a tomato hornworm. They are green. We can actually send you a photo to put on your website to show yes. what those look like. And there are some, uh, there are all kinds of you know, remedies. I'm, I'm organic and I don't spray with that cold. That's a whole other topic I'll get to. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but they are fine. And I'm planting them at the recommended planting distance, which is about 10 inches for these um, marigolds, but um, this is a basil plant. It's a Genovese basil, and those do not like cool weather, cold weather. They don't, um, that's one reason this plant's no larger than it is. I started this from seed a good while back, and it's, it's had several setbacks. You can see yellow leaves, um, and I have to put it inside sometimes. The reason is uh, some of these tender potatoes, a tropical plant, I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit too, but and the basil they are not enjoying these 40 degree nights that we've been having mm -hmm. so i'm waiting until the next cold snap is over to put the basil out but the nice thing about uh, the, the basil and the marigolds is they do help to deter tomato hornworms doesn't mean you'll never see one you should scout regularly and Kate pull it says off they, those caterpillars are huge they are <laughs> huge and they're disgusting <laughs> big old green ugh. You know, and what I'm going to do with my, and I do have a lot more basil where this came from. I started a lot of that. You see, I will plant it close to each, so that each tomato plant has its very young basil that cozies up to it. And because uh, basil can get really large when it gets warm. And that seems to have a, it's, in the past, my experience has been that that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Plus, who doesn't like basil? I mean, really, you know, <laughs> but, so that's going back inside tonight until after, um, well, since I said I'd mention the cold weather, this is as good a time as any. Yes. There's a polar vortex. Did you know? It's on its way. 
and um, it's affecting all the way down as far the frost as far as North Georgia is what we it's predicted. Mm -hmm. Well, we might not get frost here, but it's it's supposed to go down to maybe 43 degrees. It went down to 40 degree, 43 degrees here last night at this farm. We're not that far from Montgomery. They're, so, we're in Tallahassee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to wait until the next 43 degree weather prediction is over to put these tender veg out, give them the best chance I possibly can to, to get started. Um, so that's more about that. Okay, let's do this tomato as well. I'm, the do you tomatoes have the water are, you're using? I will. Okay. Do, do them both. Okay. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> now, um, this one I picked because it is more representative of what you're going to, if you just walk into the um, garden shop and get a tomato, Plant. This is a Rutgers, an heirloom, which is highly recommended. And um, scissors. Yeah, scissors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Challenge compared to the last two, but I wanted to show you again a more normal planting situation. Again, I've pre-measured this. That's where we want the stem to come up. So I will do it. But in this case, I'm just going to dig down a little. I may not have to do much. Oh, I hit a rock. Let's get that out of there. Yeah. I, I don't think it would appreciate that rock too much. No. <laughs> and then I know I'm going to take this this little um, branch off. But this one doesn't have too many. I just got this the other day, so I really haven't spent a lot of time with it. But um, this one I think I can just dig down pretty deep and give it plenty of help with that root system in the stem. So that is Rutgers. And I'll come back and mulch around all of these. Newspaper, to, to mostly for weed suppression, and then a nice thick layer of hay. And I wanted you to see that I've already done that plant because it's already starting to convey some of the uh, advantages of mulch, which is, first of all, it helps to conserve moisture soil as warm as it you know it's got sunshine um, shining on it today and tomorrow hopefully and the next day so as the soil absorbs that and the surrounding area that newspaper and hay will help to conserve that moisture and that and that temp that more moderate temperature but it also does as I said keep weeds down so let me walk and we would love to hear them and you see when by the way this is the one that I kind of had to plant some of it over to the side. So you notice I'm not just watering the plant, I'm watering out to the side where I planted some of the root ball. And I'm trying not to wet the leaves. So you'll see I'm not aiming my can right over the plant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll just leave those pots here and pick them up later. Now, we're going to start planting some seeds. Whether you're planting seeds or you're planting transplants, um, it's important to space them out correctly. And we talked about why you do that with tomatoes. With those pepper plants, those when I plant those other banana peppers, those will be about a foot apart. That's the recommended um, spacing. But you might be asking, well, how do you know? I mean, do you just know these things? Um, that's where Alabama Cooperative Extension System comes in again. Uh, they actually have a publication, which I'm going to show them this. If I can see this. Um, you can, they, they have several publications but, um, that would help with this information. But this one is based on ANR 0063 that tells planting, you know, what you can plant in this area that grows well, planting dates for spring and fall, how many seeds, if you're counting how many seeds are to, to put in a row, and then the spacing. So, like for bush beans, they're saying, well, you, every two to three inches you can plant a bush bean, a, a seed. So, I'll tell you, um, it's funny that I mentioned the word so. There's an even easier way to find out. <laughs> yes. It's an app. It's called So, S-O-W, and it is through the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. You can download it on either an Android or an um, iPhone, which is what I have, and um, it's with you all the time. So when I have my phone with me and I'm just wondering, I left my cullet board in there. How far apart should those seeds be planted? I can look it up and so Adrian, and it'll tell you about your county yes uh, so that you know what you can grow right now today in your county yes. in Alabama or in North yeah. Carolina you tell you tell it your county and it tells you exactly uh, what you can plant today it also has a, a calendar if you want to say well I want to know what I can plant on June 1st you can look at that 
and it tells you characteristics of each of the plants, including planting depth, spacing between. That's what I've been relying on. And, and um, I will um, send, that will be in my pictures. We're going to have a plethora of pictures from this. <laughs> um, but that will be one of them, is a picture of what the app looks like on our Facebook page mm. later. Okay. Where to now, Dr. Borden? Well, I think a lot of people like cucumbers. Okay. So, I do. I do, too. <laughs> so, and, oh, let me... I have to be very organized or else I'll forget what I'm supposed to do. So I make out every spring a planting diagram for what I want to put in each. Each of these beds has a number, 1 through 16, and so I notate what I'm going to plant in that. And that way I have a record so that um, I don't plant the same thing in that same bed the next year. Um, there's a principle called crop rotation, which also applies to home gardening, not just big fields of, of corn or something like that. Uh, because you don't, the, it, different vegetable families have different pests and diseases that tend to afflict them. And so by crop rotation, you just, some of those things that can persist in the soil, a lot more detail than that, more than you want to know right now. But just take my word for it, about every three years, you want to you know, not come back to that same spot with that same family. And again, ACES has some really good publications about that, specifically about what the different vegetable families are and how to do that again next year. Um, so that's one thing that helps. But also, now I know where I want to put my cucumbers because I've, I've made sure I did not plant a cucurbit or anything in that, that cucumber family there last year or the year before. So we're going to go to bed number three, which is right over there. And... but we just want to give you an idea of how to plant them. Um, if you have been gardening at all before, with especially vegetable gardening, but even flower gardening, you probably, these will look familiar, seed packets, right? Yes. <laughs> um, now, there are different kinds of, I actually have three different kinds of cucumbers that I plan to plant in this bed, and I'm not going to try to do them all today, but I'll tell you that one of the most common that you can find around this area is straight eight. So I'm starting with that one. One year, she had this bumper crop of cucumbers. Uh -huh. you remember that, Dad? I do. It was good. It was, she pickled and went nuts with the pickles. Yeah, I do make pickles. And we <laughs> ate a lot of cucumbers. It was just so good. I love cucumbers, especially, you, you know, since they're organic, there's mm -hmm. no pesticides. She doesn't spray. So you can just pick that cucumber and just... Yep. Chomp right in. That's <laughs> I prefer to peel mine and slice it, but That's you true. eat it however some you the, like. Some of the stuff you threw that year, you had to peel it. You didn't want yeah. to eat those peels. <laughs> right. All right. Now, the nice thing about a seed packet, not only is it pretty, but um, it also, most, even if you don't want to get your ACES app going, they will t recommend the planting method for this. And this one is telling you that you want to have them, um, the, the seed only buried a half an inch under the soil. And you want to have put two seeds in every 12 inches. So they're basically going to have be a foot apart. And then sometimes they tell you about thinning. So they're recommending we put two seeds in to make sure that somebody germinates, right? Hopefully one of them. And then when you get to the point they have three leaves, then you want to just have one plant every 12 inches. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow their directions exactly. And now on depth, I have... I think I got this spade from my mother. God that, rest her soul. I've seen that ago. spade for a long time. This is my go-to. Old, falling apart. I don't care. I love it dearly. Probably most gardeners have some tool like that that they, they wouldn't part with. And so this is an inch. It has the inches marked off. Well, my, my um, experience has been that even if it says a half an inch, I might not go even quite that deep. The main thing is you don't want you want it so that it doesn't get washed away in a rain or anything like that. And also birds, birds can be a problem. <laughs> so you're only going an inch with this one? So no, half, half, an, half, oh, inch, oh, half an inch. Oh, yeah, you don't need this for that. No, I don't, but <laughs> I'm showing them how I can. Uh, some of the, like corn, that's an inch. No, some of the mm -hmm. others can be a little mm -hmm. deeper. So here are my two that I'm going to plant. And actually, since I have extra plants, these there. are so that I don't plant or something on top of them later. So that looks like about right. And you pat it down really well so that to keep, you know, 
keep it in there when it gets watered so you don't want it fluffy on top. Now I'm going to label straight eight. I think I'll know these are cucumbers since I know what a straight eight is. So, But if you think you might forget it's a cucumber, you could write that in too. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna put it where the seed is for now to remind myself. But ultimately, I'll probably divide this bed into thirds and plant a third of each of the kinds of cucumbers I've purchased. And so I'll probably end up with a plant tag right at the head of the bed. And then when I change types of cucumbers, mm -hmm. you know, I'll, I'll put a different tag up there. Okay. So that's cucumbers. Oh, watering can. Watering, watering can. Watering can. Thanks. Oil can. <laughs> Oil can. Ooh, I'll need to top up the water pretty soon. And these, I've talked about mulch. What I have to do with when it's a seeded bed like this is wait until the seed, seedlings emerge and I can see where all the different plants are going to be. And then I'll go back and I will apply newspaper and hay as a mulch. Okay. Because otherwise the weeds, I mean, in no time around here, the weeds would be terrible. So. Would you like me to fill up your watering can? Your that would be nice, yes. And I'll go ahead and. If I can get up. If you can get up, yeah. <laughs> okay, and I may make up a cheat sheet to remind myself what we'd like to do next. Next, I think people like squash. Well, I'm gonna tell you a little story about my squash on the way there. And then we're gonna do the next best thing and that's plant a pumpkin seed. Okay, if I can get up. <laughs> my squash, I already planted. And the reason is, well, for one thing, that we weren't having a cold snap at the time and it seems right and according to the planting date recommended by the ACES publication, it was, it was fine. It does have been fine even in the cold weather. But what I do with my squash, this is not pretty, I'll warn you, but it works for me. Um, when I plant squash... Let me get closer to you. When I plant squash or pumpkins, they're in the same family, um, there is a horrible pest called a squash vine. Uh, there's also squash bugs that are really uh, a pest too. They're both problems, uh, and we have lots of, you know, varmints and vegetation around here, and they seem to have lots of places they can overwinter. Uh, so what I've done the past two years, this is my third, to use this strategy, and the last two years I have to say it worked. And that is, I go ahead and plant the seeds for my squash plants, and let's see if you can, I don't know, if, I know Adrian's going to post a picture of that too, if you can see through there. Yes, I have taken a picture of that. Yes, and then I, when the, once those seeds have emerged, I put newspaper around it. I don't bother with the hay, and I'll tell you why. I have them weighted down with rocks, because that pretty soon, if you've ever dealt with squash, you know it's going to go everywhere. It's, it, has, it spreads out and crawls, <laughs> and it'll cover all this newspaper. And the newspaper will, and I, this is a relatively thin layer of newspaper, I'd say three or four, two or three sheets at least. Um, I didn't get real technical about it because I knew it wouldn't show. And I will move, remove the rocks at that point because the vines from the squash plants will be weighting them down. But why is this on here? Because again, in my experience, this has helped deter the, lay, the squash vine borers from laying eggs in these little delicate, this stage of the plant. And by the time, I'll tell you when I take this off, if you know, squash plants have beautiful yellow blossoms. Uh, they have to be pollinated. And so the first time I see, and this plant actually is one I bought as a transplant. That's why it's so much bigger. I normally don't do that, but I decided to do it twice. Um, <laughs> um, whenever I see the first yellow blossom, I'm going to need to remove this row cover because I'll, uh, the, uh, the pollinators, bees, etc., can't get to them with this row cover. This is this is what we call an insect barrier, uh, floating row cover, and um, you can see it's we got it from Avalon. But uh, it has to come off at that point. But by that time, the plants are sturdy, strong, established, and uh, then I do have to scout. That's especially whether you're organic or not. You need to be see. Look there, the guy there trying to get in right now. I have a big problem with crickets too. So um, now the nice thing there's we aren't talking about fall veg per se, but in the fall I have to do the same thing when I plant cucurbits. I'm, I'm sorry, not cucurbits. What am I saying? Um, brassicas, like um, maybe uh, collards, or kale, um, anything in that family. The nice thing about those plants is they don't have blossoms, so I can leave my row cover on there for a good while until they get so big I have to remove them because they're coming through the top. Um, and the main reason I have to uh, do that for the fall veg when they're delicate and small 
is we have a problem with grasshoppers that want to eat the leaves. So if I put a, a tiny little kale plant in, there won't be much left of it the next day if I leave it uncovered. <laughs> so um, the row cover is a, a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. All right, so next we're going to talk, get to pumpkin. I was, when, you okay. were, when you went to fetch the water, I was talking about why I went ahead and planted the squash. So, but uh, a squash, and most people know a pumpkin is a form of squash. It's in the same family. So I'm going to, since I haven't planted any pumpkins yet, do, I have two different kinds small sugar and Seminole. So I think I'll start with the small sugar. Okay. And I'm just going to do one of those today okay, as a Dad demonstration. Wants to see the packet. Oh yes, see the packet. Good. And then while we're looking, we're going to look at what it tells us there about planting. It's on the side there. A half an inch to an inch of depth and two to four inches in spacing. Um, two to four feet in spacing. And um, I am going to split the difference and plant them three feet apart. Okay. And I have often read three feet apart for a pumpkin plant, it's about right. So, And they, they too, of course, will sprawl and go crazy. Was it the year before last that I had a bumper crop of pumpkins? I think I did. I must have had 40 or 50, maybe more. You I had made, so many I made pumpkins. pumpkin everything. I was like the Forrest Gump of pumpkins. You yes, know, like, and she gave them to us. Russell and I made yeah. pumpkin bunch of times. It was great. So when the pumpkins get going and ha happy, you know. You don't think, oh, I'm going to grow some pumpkins and eat some squash, but that's good eating. Yeah. Well, we need to go down to the other end of the, uh, to, to plant what those. Bed? That bed number is, I'm glad you asked. Uh, that's going to be number 12. Okay. So it's that last bed down there right by, beside those peas. Okay. Which hopefully, I don't mind you showing off my peas to people. <laughs> <laughs> spring peas, that is, spring peas. Okay, so with these pumpkins, remember it said, that, and since I'm not spacing them or doing anything more, I'm going to be sure I label first so I don't forget what I planted. Okay. This is small sugar. And I do tend to plant pumpkins, I can, I, I don't plant them to make jack o' lanterns. So there's my label, and I am going to let's see what they were saying about. Um, mound it up a little with squash plants. You typically didn't have to do that with the cucumber, but. It's a squash, so I'm going to mound it. And it's not, again, if your soil is nice and pliable like this is, it actually has a lot of rocks. <laughs> <laughs> it has um, some soil on it. That's actually a good thing, because ultimately I'm going to weight all of this down. You don't want drip tape exposed to the sun like that. It buckles and that sort of thing. So it'll all be covered up with soil and or mulch by the time all is said and done. So there's my mound. And I am just going to put a couple of these in. Um, usually the squash, maybe three. And the same principles apply for pumpkin as they would other squash, pretty much? In, in terms of principles, you mean? How many seeds to plant? And yes, and, and to keep them, they're, they're recommending three foot spacing between mounds so that um, probably if I got three of these, two or three, I'd be fine. So you're just pushing those down into the mound? Yes, because remember I said that the planting depth was a half an inch, right? To an inch, yes. To an inch. And I'm going to go with the lesser. But I want to pat it in really well. Squash seeds are... It, I've had experience with having them float to the top real easily. They're kind of lightweight. Did we, did we really take a look at the seed? Maybe not. Um, well, a lot, most people have eaten pumpkin seeds before, so they know what they... But see how they're just kind of little light and fluffy? And so, Hold it still. Hold it still. and flat, and flat, right? So I really want to make sure those are mashed in mm -hmm. as well as possible, and lightly watered, so that I don't have them washed up to the top and float away. Right. So now, that's why I like this watering, the kind of watering can like this, with the kind of gives it a shower. Thank you. 
and I'll come back and again we'll need run some drip irrigation later to make sure. Um, one thing about planting seeds, and, it, and I learned this the hard way, is that um, you don't want to let the seeds dry out. That is, until they germinate and you see green coming up, keep that soil moist. Because what is going to help a seed germinate is soil, moisture, and then ultimately it'll, it'll reach for the sun, but, and moisture. So uh, it means even though I've got my drip set to water maybe twice a week, I may need to come out here and water if I don't have rain uh, every day just to give them a, just to keep them moist. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we talked about toilets. Uh, all we have to do is look right over here. You may be wondering, why do I have a trellis here with nothing planted? <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> um, the answer is, first of all, we wanted to get the trellis in before the plants. I actually have sweet potato plants already, um, and they're ready to go in. The problem is the polar vortex. Yes. <laughs> um, they are tropical plants. I mentioned that when we were over there. I got off the subject, I guess. but um, And they don't like cold weather at all. And typically, May in Alabama is usually just fine. But this year, no. So now that I we got the trellis up, but I said, you know, let's look at the forecast. Mm -hmm. And I think Friday and Saturday, wee hours of the morning, both times, or maybe it's sat Friday night and Saturday, so into you know wee hours on Sunday, uh, it could be in the low 40s. And if it says 43 for here, we're typically three degrees less than that. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to take a chance. I've gone this long without planting them. They can wait a little bit longer. And another story I'll tell you is I, I ordered, I bought some of my uh, sweet potato plants from the uh, garden shop, but then I ordered some online. Don't ask me why I did that, but I ordered some slips. Um, but for one thing, I like white sweet, sweet potatoes and I couldn't get those in the store. So I ordered some slips from a, a company that's based in North Carolina. And I, Co corresponded with them not too long ago and said, well, when are my sweet potatoes coming? They are not shipping out until the end of May because that's when their farmers can get it to them. So, in a way, they did me a favor. At first, I was a little upset because I thought, I'm ready to plant them now. But it wouldn't have been a good idea. So, um, first of all, I'm not saying I'm recommending, don't necessarily say you need to order them online. But they were reacting to what their local conditions are. Mm -hmm. And that's turning out to be a lot more like what ours are, are <laughs> this year. This year, <laughs> this right. Year. Um, so, th so this will stay vacant until probably early next week. Okay. In fact, you might want to talk about a follow-up visit in the summer. Yes, so we will be following up with this to come back and see what the fruits of the labors of today have to, um, what's come out of these um, in July. So we will we'll have another bloom where you are in July, where we can check in on everything and see what it's time to plant then. Yeah. Oh, you know what? We're gonna plant okra. That's right. Ooh, I Do love you all okra. like okra? Some people really don't like it. I, I think you either like it or you don't, right? Uh -huh. And that's gonna be in bed number two. Okay. Do you need your cart? Yes, I'd like that. Thank you. Okay. We're switching up the system. because it's not going to germinate if the soil's too cool. And okra's one you don't, I mean, I've seen people buy okra plants in the store, but honestly, save yourself some money and just get the seed. It's a lot cheaper that way. Um, and I'm sorry, that thing's gotten kind of messed up. Let's pull it over. Sometimes my uh, drip tape wants to get a little curly, but I can straighten it out later. Okay, now okra does not like to be too close together because the plants can get very large. And this year, I bought two different varieties of okra. Actually, three. Um, because I'll tell you about the third one in a minute. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> I feel like there's a story there. There is a story. Um, I got, first of all, and this is what I'm going to plant today, Clemson spineless. This is the most frequently planted in this area. It grows well in this area. Mm -hmm. You go into almost any 
garden shop that sells seeds, you can probably find Clemson Spinalis. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get very tall. Uh, we could also, if we ever want to put a picture up there for the, the time you and I were planting. Oh my <laughs> God. It got to be about 14 feet We took tall pictures with our, oh, you Y'all, I'm so sorry. I'm having trouble. That's okay. That is okay. Well, I'm sorry at home, everybody. <laughs> Hopefully you're not peeking. <laughs> Um, we don't want to get oh, we got upside down. Okay, this is good. Okay, um, but we're right side up now. Good, and um, we're good. I apologize. <laughs> the cameraman. Y'all, listen. Dad is using his Christmas gift from his children, which is called a gimbal, and um, it was actually in one of the pictures I posted um, as a teaser about half an hour before we began, but it orients, it's like a steady cam. If any of you know about steady cam on, on movie sets, he can move it around like this and the, it kind of glides where he, it's, it's really cool. It's really spiffy. So anyway, but um, not quite cool was, enough. <laughs> well, <catty wonkers. laughs> well, just take my word for what the seed packet says, since I don't want to have to interfere with that again. This one, the okra seeds are a fairly good size and see, look at these cute. Um, you can plant these one half to one inch deep and um, a group of three seeds every 18 inches. Now, I would, the reason I was saying I would not recommend their planting them closer than that is that they really do get large. And um, we talked about the height and the funny picture you can probably yes. see that. But they also just spread out. So you want to be sure you honor that 18 inches. And one year I didn't do that, uh, partly because I planted them too close together and I thought I'd bend them and I didn't have the heart to pull up that okra plant and I should have. But they were too close together. So uh, if you do, now some, there are some dwarf varieties that can be cl uh, planted closer. And this one, I'm going to try it, red burgundy. It is saying you could plant them a, a foot apart. I'll probably try that. Mm -hmm. But for just your garden variety, everyday okra, from the spinal, half inch to an inch deep and you want that um and three seeds right so right here is as good as any and i'll make my i'll make my tag I'm not forgetting that and i'm planting it right near the drip tape so that and that's one thing i didn't talk about with the others the other seeds but the nice thing about having the drip tape is if i'm going to keep, have, have a regular watering schedule anyway they will get moisture these drip uh, hoses have about every foot have an emitter that comes out and drips water onto the, onto the soil. So there is my Clemson Spinalis. Oh, I know what, where I was going with the thing getting so tall, the plant getting so tall, is I did not know until I'd been a master gardener for several years that you can actually, that you should, in around about August, late summer maybe, cut that thing back and you can, it'll actually produce more okra. You uh -huh. get plenty of okra, but it's just, and it's, probably a better crop in, in some ways. There's a learning curve. There's a learning curve. Mine took a while. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'll know that that's where my crimson spinelist is. Michelle Veal Borden says we are so avant-garde. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I did tell you, uh, I promised that I would tell about the third type of okra. Yes, I want to hear the story. Well, it's not that glamorous of a story. There's a type <laughs> of pepper um, hot pepper that I always used to plant. Um, I like to, to grow my own hot peppers to put in stew, uh, stew seasonings and that kind of thing. And um, I guess salsa, if I have made salsa, but definitely in stew. And uh, I found one that's kind of a mild pot called uh, cow horn. So I walked in and I never found the seeds to it. I always had to just buy a plant. Um, so I thought, well, I'm just not gonna quit looking for the seeds. So I walked into the feed and seed store, our farmer's co-op, and I got so excited because I found this pot packet that said cow horn. Cow horn okra? Well, I'm covering it up on oh, purpose. Oh, okay. Oh, it sorry. said cow horn, so I bought some. Oh, no. And then I realized, if you can see, they had checked off by okra. Oh, my it's God. It's not a pepper. So last year, I bought some of these, and I planted them anyway. I said, well, I'll just see what cow horn okra was like. It's really good. Is so, it hot? No, it's not hot. It's okay. okra. Okay. <laughs> well, I didn't know if it was an, a spicy no, it's, okra. I don't know. I, it, it's shaped a little like a cow horn. I, I mean, it, it's a little thinner, curvy, uh, but very nice. So I bought more. All right. 
show. Now that's it. For, oh, watering in. Water. And then I want to talk a little bit about. I'm this. sorry. It's so heavy. Yeah, you keep kind of overkill. <laughs> it's okay. We will come back. I'll go around and water all these beds again later, um, where we've just planted seeds. Yeah. Okay. So now we were going to talk about a couple of other goings on out here. Yeah. What is a strawberry? A strawberry yes. is not really a vegetable, but I do plant them in my vegetable garden anyway. We like strawberries, and um, see some of the fruit trees out here, muscadines and um, those uh, golden kiwi. Yes. Again. Mm -hmm. Um. Also, while y'all are finding your way, going to say, if you tune in Monday for Pandemic Pantry, we will be doing quite a few things with strawberries. So hopefully this will inspire you. Yes. All right, so let's talk about this strawberry bed. First of all, you're probably wondering, why do I have CDs hanging there? <laughs> <laughs> I have bird problems and, and squirrels too, but birds just love my little berries and uh, at first they were only taking the ripe ones and then they started getting the ones that weren't even ripe yet and just leaving the carcasses. <laughs> so mm. um, I thought the CDs might scare them away. They didn't, but I didn't, I didn't have time to you know, remove them. I thought, well, maybe it scares something away. I don't know. Uh, however, I have started a new strategy. You see the way I've got row cover there on that for the squash? Because Lee, very considerately put these wires here for me for this uh, CDs. I decided it, in every evening to drape row cover over these and to leave it on until I'm out here because the, the birds typically don't come and bother anything when I'm out here and That's I'm out here gardening. True. So um, this is the first time I've had ripe red strawberries in a while since giving it a chance. Now the one downside of having row cover of course is see the little white blossoms? Those need pollination, uh, pollinators. And um, so I have to, that's, I try to get down here to leave the robe cover off as long as I possibly can so that the pollinators can get to them. But other than that, so Adrian, would you like a strawberry? I would love a strawberry. How about this one right That here? looks pretty, yeah. Look at that, everybody. That is a beautiful strawberry. I'm just gonna one-handedly. Here, um, how about help? if I use two hands? Yeah, I usually just, yeah, pull it that way. That's perfect. Doesn't that look good? And you can eat it right off the plant if you want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so delicious. Mm. So good. That I'm is glad. beautiful. I'm mm. glad. All right, so here's the thing about strawberries. When did I plant these? I planted those last October. Um, in Alabama, this, this section of Alabama, central Alabama, I have found that one of the top um, varieties that grows well is the... Um, Camarosa, which is what these are, and um, sometimes I haven't been able to find those in the big box stores anywhere. Um, the other thing I have learned is that, like the you picks, I mean, the, I, I've learned all this from uh, the first crop of uh, first set of transplants I got, to, or plugs, I guess would be the right word, to put in in October. I got through the gentleman who owns uh, Oakview Granary. He had some extra ones. Um, and I don't know, it certainly was just something great all went along. The only time you really need to worry about frost on strawberry plants is if they're already blooming, as you've seen with those white blooms, and you have a late frost, then you should cover them. But um, so October is great, and what happens then is over the winter, they develop a great root system, much stronger, and then I have a lovely crop the following spring. Um, it, it, you know, the, 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 the sad fact is, though, it's very difficult to get strawberries like that in October. Um, I've tried a couple of different avenues. One is I went online and inquired about buying, buying some strawberries, and they said, that's fine. We can sell you Camarosa, plugs, put it in right now. You need 500? In other words, <laughs> they were not uh, cut out to sell to a small gardener like myself. Uh -huh. um, so one of my master gardener friends and I uh, learned of a gentleman who has a farm in uh, the, uh, well, the northern part of the state, not too far from here, north central, and uh, we were able to get strawberries from him and put them in in October. And she and I both had really good luck with our strawberries um, when we planted them in the fall. Yay. So, so that's what I recommend if you can make it work. If not, let's say you can you go to the garden shop and they have quinault or some other kind of strawberry. If you can get it in the fall, put that in. Mm -hmm. It'll still probably be really good. Um, but I, I like doing this, and if I'm able to get them again next year, I'll spread. Okay. 
Yeah, more or less. Mm -hmm. So uh, I hope that you can, you know, some, someone will learn from this and enjoy their strawberries. Well, I know well, Kate was asking about the strawberries. Yes. Well, and that, that's, that's the, those are the facts. Okay. Now, I wanted to talk about this. This is the corn I planted. And you can plant corn pretty early. It's no problem with the cold that we've had. Um, we mentioned having to adapt to the cold as a weather condition. That's what all good gardeners learn after a while is that one must adapt to whatever the current weather conditions are. Yesterday was crazy windy. So I think I talked about that already, right? Did I yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but I am going to mulch around it because um, the corn will need to be um, kept, you know, moderated. Their soil mm -hmm. will need moderating. Well, why like don't we, let's walk the long way around, okay. meet the girls, mm -hmm. and then we can mm -hmm. have some oh. questions. If y'all have any questions, we would love I to hear them. the garlic. I plant garlic oh, every yeah. year. That will, that's not ready to, to harvest yet, but um, when it is, and it, I will know it when more of the leaves are yellow than that, but not all of them. I'd say when about half the leaves are yellow, I'll pull that and start curing it. And then I'll plant something else uh, late summer. It's probably going to, I'd say, looking at it now, I think within the month I'll be able to plant this whole bed. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I love getting garlic from your garden. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Talk to us. These are spring peas that I planted <laughs> uh, in February, and they uh, are doing really well. I think we've gotten a little bit more uh, late crop from them than usual because it has been cooler. So this is something else. Maybe we can reach right off the of I would love to. A nice big succulent. Let's see what you. Oh, here's one. Well, is that? That's a nice succulent, succulent one, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I see one. Oh dear, yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Right here. Now, you know what? That's a shelling pea. Oh, let me show you. Can I not eat it? You can, yeah. It's not going to be as good. If I can get it off. There we go. And then, I'm going to try it. Is it skin puff? That's good. It's yeah. really good. Here's another really good juicy one. I'll point out to you. Mm. This one? That. Mm. Usually, the way I can tell they're ripe is when the little top up here, the leaves around the uh, outside from it get yeah, they get brown, they turn brown, and it's um, this is to just. Mm. Okay, I'm glad. let's go meet the girls. Meet the girls, yeah. These are our pets. <laughs> no, they're not. They've got delicious eggs. But they're our pets. Are they out? They're. I think they've gone in there. Also. I call them the three French hens. Well, one of them was mm -hmm. underneath. Here she comes. Oh, Here they come. hello. Girls on parade. Okay, the, the one that's coming out first, who's kind of got a gray beard, she's an Easter egger and her name is Leilani. And the one behind her, the other Easter egger is Melba. And the Rhode Island Red is Edna Earl. Hey, girls. We can look and see if anybody laid an egg. I don't see Yeah. I got one earlier today. Oh, yeah, there's one. Oh, good. Right Where you want to come? Oh, good. Oh, that is me. one of Melba's eggs. Chickens, and she said, I don't know what to call these, but they're beautiful. And I said, those are Easter eggers. So, mm -hmm. that was one thing I already knew. <laughs> good. And our Easter eggers, they, they, their eggs can, an Easter egger can lay, um, kind of, this is a sort of a light turquoise or a blue egg, or even some cases pink. Our two girls, one of them lays this pretty little, really pastel light uh, mm -hmm. turquoise, and that's Melba. And Leilani's tend to be more of a army green kind of one. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty. No offense. <laughs> Close your ears. No, yeah, um, no offense. <laughs> okay. Um, so, if anyone has any questions, we would love to hear them. But um, I do have one, which is the case for me what if you don't have sun oh that's a really good question uh, to grow vegetables you need to have six to eight hours of sun sunlight per day okay. um now i know your situation yes. which is the back of back area of where she lives um is very shady but the front gets a lot of sun gets mm -hmm. six to eight hours so 
we fixed it up so she has these beautiful containers out front on the two front uh, opposite either side of the door and uh, we just put some nice vegetables in there. Mm -hmm. Want to talk about what you have? Yeah, why don't we go on over here? I'm, I think I might have a better signal over here. Um, I have planted right now peppers, tomatoes, uh, basil. Mom had a lot of basil. And I also have, um, what else do I have? Um, do you have, uh, I, do you have a couple of marigolds? Marigolds. Mm -hmm. So I've been watering those. She was over the other day. With, you know, we're having to social distance like all of you. Um, when she was over the other day, she planted those, and they already are looking beautiful. So I'm excited about those. And one type of plant, a uh, vegetable I wanted to give her, because I know she likes them, are uh, eggplant. But my, the eggplant is another vegetable that doesn't like the cool weather that we've been having. So my eggplant transplants are really small right now, but I guarantee you, you will eventually get some more. Okay, well great, well thank you. And y'all, it's two, you've heard the chimes. Um, we hope you've enjoyed today, uh, Bloom Where You Are. And thank you, Dr. Borden, and thank you, Mr. Borden, farmer, the Farmer Borden. <laughs> thank you for your help today. Um, and we will be back in July for another installment and see how everything's doing. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you Monday for Pandemic Pantry.